Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk about a commonly held misconception that if you do not like modern portfolio theory, you cannot do discounted cash flow valuations. Let's separate the two concepts. In discounted cash flow valuation, we argue that the value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows in the asset. Nothing more, nothing less. So in the numerator, you've got your expected cash flows across all possible scenarios. And in your denominator, you've got the discount rate reflecting the risk in those cash flows. There's nothing in this model that requires a specific technique or model or theory to come up with the discount rate. All the discounted cash flow valuation says the value of an asset is the present value of its risk-adjusted cash flows. Now, of course, you have to come up with the discount rate. And which discount rate you come up with depends on what you're trying to value. I like to use a concept called the financial balance sheet to kind of frame the way we think about discount rates and cash flows. In a financial balance sheet, on the asset side, I break down the assets of a company into investments it's already made and growth assets, investments I expect you to make in the future. And on the liability side of the balance sheet, I've got debt and equity. There are two ways I can frame a valuation. I can value the entire business by taking the cash flows from all of your assets, assets in place and growth assets, and discounting them back at a weighted average of your cost of equity and your cost of debt, which of course is the cost of capital. What I get then as a present value would be the value of the operating business you have. The other way I can approach valuation is again focus just on the equity investors. Look at their cash flows and discount them back at a cost of equity. The cost of equity of course re reflects what you as an equity investor would demand for investing in the equity in the business. And if it's risky equity, presumably you demand a higher rate. So discounted cash flow valuation requires a discount rate and that discount rate can either be a cost of equity which requires you to estimate what equity investors in this company will demand as a return or a cost of capital. Now how do we come up with the cost of equity and the cost of capital? Here's where the other development in finance comes in. About 50 years ago, perhaps more, 60 years ago, Harry Markowitz had an insight, which in, in many ways has become the foundation for how modern finance thinks about risk. He looked at a company and he said, well, there's lots of risk in the company, but am I exposed to all of that risk? He argued that the risk in an investment should reflect the risk it adds on to your portfolio, not the risk of the company standing alone. That's a pretty, pretty common sense proposition. Of course, modern finance went further. It argued that the marginal investor, the investor who sets prices on your company, is a diversified investor. Not supremely diversified necessarily, but diversified enough that when they looked at a stock or a company, they looked at a, the risk added by that stock to a diversified portfolio. That marginal investor also has choices. They can invest in something riskless or something risky. And if you bring those two concepts together, in addition with, to a trust in markets, what you end up with is the modern portfolio theory focus on risk. So I'm going to give you a very speedy and compressed measure of how different models in modern portfolio theory approach the measurement of risk. The oldest of these models, of course, is the capital asset pricing model. And in the capital asset pricing model, we make two significant assumptions. The first is there are no transactions costs. And the second is you really don't know what's cheap or expensive. There's no private information. In that world, diversification will be carried to its logical limit and investors are going to be supremely diversified. Diversified into a portfolio that includes every traded asset in the market. The risk of a stock then becomes a risk added to this market portfolio and that risk is captured with a single beta. The CAPM of course was the first model to come up with an explicit way of connecting risk to expected returns in modern portfolio theory. And in 1964, when it came out, it was viewed as a godsend, a way of estimating expected returns, costs of equity, based on the risk of that equity. Of course, it makes some very strong assumptions. In the years since, people have tried to adapt or modify, expand the model. Then the arbitrage pricing model tried to do that by arguing, okay, the risk you care about is the risk you cannot diversify. Well, on that they agreed. But then it said, why should we try to measure all of that risk with one market portfolio and one beta? The arbitrage pricing model allows for multiple sources of market risk and a beta against each one. The arbitrage pricing model fundamentally is a statistical model because the way it comes up with the number of sources of market risk and the beta against each one is by looking at past data. There's a trust in markets kicking in and coming up with the number of market risk factors and the betas against each one. 
the arbitrage pricing model's weakest link was it was a statistical model. Multi-factor models basically put names on the factors. Bas what they do is they bring in macroeconomic names to each of the factors and estimate betas against each one. So you've got the cap M, where the risk is measured with one beta, the arbitrage pricing model, where the risk is measured with multiple betas against unspecified factors, and multi-factor models, which allow for multiple source of market risks, which are named, and betas against each one. All of these models, though, stem from modern portfolio theory. The belief that the marginal investor is diversified is embedded in here. The, fa the betas and the factors are often obtained by looking at past data, past price data, and those models are assumed to give you the expected return on an investment. So the two have, in a sense, gotten entwined because as discounted cash flow models have become more widely used, modern portfolio theory has also risen. But let's face it, there are assumptions in modern portfolio theory that make people uncomfortable. And in particular, if you do not like beta or beta, so the way modern portfolio theory estimates risk and the cost of equity, well, you've got to tell me what you don't like about modern portfolio theories focused. You could tell me that you don't like the focus on the diversified investor, that the investors pricing stocks looking at risk are not diversified and therefore you should be bringing in some of that risk you can eliminate through diversification. Maybe that's your, that's your beef with traditional models. The other is you might not like the fact that we use past prices to come up with our, pro, with our risk measures, our beta or betas. If you can tell me what you don't like about modern portfolio theory, I'm going to argue that I can come up with a way of estimating risk because after all, traditional discounted cash flow evaluation does not require that you use beta or betas to come up with your cost of equity and capital. We just use them because they're convenient. So if you can tell me what you don't like about these models, I can suggest alternatives to you. So let me frame what these alternative choices, ways of measuring risk will look like depending on why you don't like risk and return models from modern portfolio theory. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, do you believe that the marginal investors of price risk are diversified? If the answer to that is yes, then we can go to the next step. And then I'm going to ask you, do you believe in price-based risk measures? And the answer is yes to that as well. Then you end up with the modern portfolio theory models, the CAPM, the arbitrage pricing model, and the multi-factor model. If you say no to the price-based risk measure, then perhaps what you're looking for is some measure of risk, which is still a measure of risk that looks at only the risk you cannot diversify away, but is not dependent on past stock prices. Well, the easiest alternative, of course, is to go with accounting data. Maybe you believe that accounting earnings are less susceptible to game playing, more intrinsic than prices. So there's a concept called accounting betas. We use accounting earnings to estimate the beta for a company. The problem with accounting data is it's not updated as often as market price data, but if you truly abhor or dislike market price data, that's one way you can get around it, is to use accounting betas to come up with your cost of equity and cost of capital. The other is to actually avoid the entire process of estimating equity betas and equity cost of equity, but start with the cost of debt, which you can often observe. So let's say your company's cost of debt is 5%, and you could tell me that your equity is twice as risky as your debt. Well, your cost of equity should be 10%, right? The key, of course, is telling me how much risk your equity is in the debt, and you have to come up with your own proxies for that. So if you don't like price-based risk measures, you either have to go with accounting numbers, accounting earnings, accounting debt ratios, or with some measure of for the cost of equity that builds off the cost of debt. If your beef is not with the price-based risk measures, but basically with the marginal investors not being diversified. So basically, you believe that investors are not diversified, but you're okay with prices. Well, I can give you alternative measures of risk. One is to not go with a beta, where you look at only the portion of the risk you cannot diversify. Look at the total standard deviation of stock. What does that mean? Let's suppose your stock has a standard deviation. Standard deviation looking across annual data using daily prices of 50%. And let's assume the average standard deviation across all stocks is 30%. 50 divided by 30 is 1.6, right? That looks a lot like a beta. The only difference is rather than focusing only on the risk you cannot diversify, we're looking at total standard deviation. You can also use proxy models. What are proxy models? Rather than try to build up an elaborate model for risk, you look backwards in time. You look to see what kinds of companies have earned high returns in the past. 
small market cap companies might have earned higher returns than large market cap companies. Low price to book ratio companies might have earned higher returns than large price to book or high price to book ratio companies. In these models, what you've done is essentially given up on measuring risk directly and using something as a stand-in for risk, the market cap of the company, the, the price to book ratio, price momentum. These are called proxy models. Some people actually combine these models with a traditional CAPM. The most common version of this, you'll see somebody estimating the cost of equity for a company, taking a risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium. So far you're in the CAPM, but then adding a small cap premium or a price to book premium or a liquidity premium. There's even an approach where you can be agnostic about risk and return models and back out from stock prices what the implied cost of equity and capital are. In fact, what you're doing is you're taking the stock price as a given, projecting cash flows in a company and solving for that rate of return, the internal rate of return that will make the present value equal to the value today, the market cap today. It's called an implied cost of equity or capital. And that effectively allows you to avoid the whole risk and return model morass that you might might not like to be you know, captured it. If you don't like the assumption that marginal investors are diversified and you don't like price-based risk measures, then you're going to have to be stuck with, again, accounting earnings, but now you're going to be looking at standard deviation earnings, not even a beta, where you look at if it, the contrast between this and accounting betas. Is in accounting betas, you take the earnings for your company and you run a regression against earnings on a market index. Here, you just look at the standard deviation accounting earnings. Again, let me give you an example. Let's assume that your company has a standard deviation accounting earnings of 25%, and the typical number for the market is 20%, the typical standard deviation earnings across the market. 25 divided by 20 is 1.25. That looks, again, like a beta, right? But it's based on accounting earnings volatility. You could even use accounting ratios as your proxy for risk. You might argue that high debt ratio companies are riskier than low debt ratio companies. Again, you're avoiding the use of prices and the measure of, earn, earning, uh, of risk that, that's built on the presumption of diversified investors. So all I'm saying here is if you don't like traditional mod modern portfolio theor theory ways of estimating risk, beta or betas, I can offer you an alternative way of thinking about risk because that really allows you to use traditional discounted cash flow valuation without getting caught up in beliefs about modern portfolio theory. So here's what I'm saying. You don't like betas? Fine. Give me your alternative way of thinking about risk. I'll come up with a measure of risk that looks very much like a beta. In other words, a relative measure of risk. This stock is one and a half times more risky than the typical stock. Then we're off to the races. I can do everything I do in a traditional discounted cash flow valuation with your proxy for risk. So my advice to you is don't link up your beliefs about or your lack of belief about modern portfolio theory and beta with whether you should use discounted cash flow valuation. Discounted cash flow valuation just requires that you come up with a way of measuring risk and building into your discount rates. It's completely agnostic about the way you come up with a discount rate. So I hope that's helped you clear up any misunderstandings you might have about whether you can use discounted cash flow valuation if you don't believe in traditional modern portfolio theory or traditional betas. The answer is, yeah, you can still use discounted cash flow valuation. Thank you very much for listening.